For more videos on people's struggles, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. COVID-19 has caused untold grief and suffering to billions across the world. But it has been very good for a handful of big pharma companies, which have made massive profits during this time. For instance, in the third quarter of 2021, that's July to September, Pfizer's revenue was US dollars 24.1 billion, which was a 134% increase from last year. How have these companies managed to earn such massive profits? And what does this say about the way the pharmaceutical sector is organized? Meanwhile, Cuba has emerged as a shining alternative. Technology has been leveraged to benefit the people rather than a few shareholders. Immunologist Dr. Satyajit Rath examines Big Pharma and the story of Cuba and explains the lessons we can draw from it. So this week, um, when we talk about COVID-19, it might be interesting and useful to think about the relationship between vaccine production um, in countries by companies, um, vaccine use within the country uh, or within the region in the case of Europe um, and vaccine export and the revenues that have been generated. So um, from that point of view, um, it's interesting to note numbers. If you look at the Chinese companies, which have produced um, between Sinovac and uh, Sinopharm, um, about, I would say, um, two and a half billion doses of vaccines. From two and a half billion doses of vaccine, the revenue that they um, show together is about oh, 40, 45 billion US dollars in 2021. On the other hand, if you look at Pfizer, Pfizer's production of vaccine has been just over a billion doses so far. 1.1 billion doses. Um, but Pfizer's revenue matches Sinopharm and Sinovac together. Um, so despite not even having produced half as many vaccines, Pfizer's revenue matches that of Sinovac and Sinopharm. This is, this is one interesting um, issue to think about. Um, it's even more striking when you look at Moderna, because Moderna has made about 400 million doses, and yet Moderna's um, revenue returns are um, somewhere in the $30 billion range. So despite having made only about a third of the number of doses that Pfizer has made, Moderna has made about 60% of the revenue that Pfizer has generated. Um, and we begin to see how the for-profit pharma sector has been very differently leveraging um, COVID vaccines for profit. Um, interestingly, um, when we begin to look at exports, we run into yet another conundrum. And that is which countries are these major productions being exported to? And it turns out because in Europe and in the United States of America, the two major vaccines, Moderna in the US and BioNTech Pfizer in Europe and um, in, in the United States together, are mRNA platform based vaccines. Their export even though formally they are exports, are quite substantially still to countries of the global north. Um, to countries of the global south, exports have primarily come from Chinese companies and from the AstraZeneca um, adenovirus platform-based vaccines. And what you then begin to see are the differences in exports in a commercial setting and exports in the context of global public health. That's one set of issues that I think um, today's times are useful and important to note. 
Another context that is important to note, especially because we have been talking about MR vaccine platforms and adenovirus vaccine platforms, is the relatively small but instructive example of the Cuban biotechnology enterprise in making um, COVID vaccines. So Cuba has indigenously designed, tested, manufactured, and effectively distributed to the overwhelming majority of its adult population two vaccines for COVID-19, not one. Um, the one of the Soberana vaccines and the Abdallah vaccine. These are vaccines that are neither based on the mRNA technology, which um, as we've all heard repeatedly is extraordinarily new and so on and so forth, nor is it based on the adenovirus vaccine uh, platform. It is instead based on, an, on, a, on a somewhat older recombinant DNA technology based protein platform. In other words, um, you, what that technology does is take the genetic sequence for the spike protein of the COVID-19 virus, get either bacteria or um, animal cells or yeast cells to make that protein, make sure that it's folded appropriately and take the protein and formulate it as a vaccine. And this is how many of the vaccines in the childhood vaccination campaigns that we are familiar with across the world in public health systems are currently made. So it's a tried and tested technology that generic vaccine manufacturers across the world, not simply in the global north, but also in the global south, are quite familiar. And that's the platform that Cuba has chosen to make these vaccines. It is useful to ask the question, how is it that Cuba could put this entire pipeline of vaccine design, testing, manufacture, and distribution into a public health vaccination campaign seamlessly into place for itself and to the extent that it could for sending overseas as well to neighboring countries. Whereas India with its vaunted um, vaccine manufacturing technology strength, bench strength, so to say, has not managed to do this. And when you begin to think about this, you realize that the capitalist for-profit company-based framework difference between the two examples is a core issue in determining what the trajectories of vaccine manufacture, vaccine distribution, and vaccine supply and production will be. So India has also done vaccine design in the country. Um, India's uh, indigenous vaccine is designed in public sector institutions. In fact, Indian public sector institutions have also designed the Cuban kind of protein-based vaccines. But a slow withering over recent decades of the Indian public sector vaccine manufacturing uh, enterprises and facilities has meant that even if vaccine design was in the public sector, its manufacture, scale up and distribution has remained in the private sector. And the differences between those are there for all of us who are interested in public health to see, appreciate and learn from. This much for this week.